much, Thomas. Um, good morning. Um, I'm, I've spent about the last 15 years looking at uh, wind thrown forests, which is really a, a direct response to climate. Um, and so, of course, the question of interest is um, what, what could happen in terms of uh, the risk of wind throw and the losses that occurred from wind throw um, under, under future climate change. And we've already heard um, in the questioning uh, earlier this morning about one of the other sort of the indirect consequences of, of wind throw in terms of um, carbon emissions and, and of course associated costs. Um, just starting out with some background um, in terms of where we've come from, uh, or where we are in terms of what wind throw has, has done uh, to New Zealand's planted forests. Uh, since records began um, in New Zealand, which is about 1945, we've had around 63,000 hectares um, of damage in our forests. Um, nearly half of that, some, somewhere between a third and a half actually, came from, from a single storm, Cyclone Bola. Um, and we've, we've had everything recorded from about three hectares of, of damage through to, as I said, 26,000 hectares from a single storm event. Um, the, the median, I've said average, the, the median is about 90 hectares um, that's, that's lost um, from, from a single storm. Uh, if we look at that um, on a, as a percentage of our net stocked area, we lose about 0.2% um, of our net stocked area to wind each year, uh, which corresponds, uh, if you sum it up, to about 5% um, of net stocked area lost over the course of a 28 year rotation. Just some examples of, of wind throw. I think you, you're all familiar with what wind thrown trees look like. But um, over time, we've had a lot of wind throw in certain areas of New Zealand, particularly Canterbury, uh, where we've had well, uh, wind enhanced by the topography of the Southern Alps. We get what's called an oreographic or a lee wave effect, has caused a lot of damage um, to planted forests on the Canterbury Plains. Um, and I think probably up until sort of the um, mid 90s. About 90% of forest harvesting in Canterbury was actually wind throw salvage. Um, saved, on harvest, oops, saved on harvesting costs. Moving further north, um, more recently we had a lot of um, damage in the southern North Island and the upper, um, upper South Island um, in the Nelson area. Um, get strong, strong effect of topography in these forests. You can see here um, some trees have been, been flattened um, where the wind has accelerated over uh, the topography, over the, the terrain. Um, and you're probably also seeing differences in soil um, soil depth and, and therefore rooting depth um, and rooting root anchorage strength in these forests. And moving a little bit further north up to our neck of the woods, um, this is recent damage from, from Easter Monday, um, where you're seeing a lot of uh, trees were, were broken, um, which causes problems in terms of value loss. Um, and even the salvaged trees, when they're sent to the sawmill, um, can, can present further, further value loss. So this is just again a summary of what, what's happened um, in, in the past. Um, you can see the main events um, showing up, you can see this. Um, please note the break in the, the y-axis, otherwise um, we wouldn't be able to show uh, the major events and, and actually even be able to see the lesser events. Um, so you can see there was, there was quite a lot of um, uh, damage uh, in, from about three or four main events, Cyclone Bowler, um, Cyclone Bernie and the 1975 event in Canterbury. Uh, a little bit of a, a hiatus in the 90s, um, but more recently there's been um, some uh, major events in southern North Island, Upper North Island, uh, sorry, southern North Island, Upper South Island. Um, and is, is this an indication of, of things to come? Is, is this an effect of climate change? <coughs> well, one thing to note here is that this graph presents the, the absolute amount of damage. One thing that's happened uh, over time, as you well aware, the total planted forest area has increased dramatically. In fact, it's more than tripled since the 1970s. So if you go back and you re-express this percentage of damage, uh, sorry, this amount of damage as a percent of the total forest estate, uh, you get a slightly different picture. So these uh, major storms in 1975 and 1987 uh, damaged around 2% of the, of the uh, next stopped area at the time. Uh, and, in, and since then, even though the damage has been quite large in absolute extent, in, relative, uh, in, in, in a relative sense, it's been, it's been a lot less. Um, and, and a number of things have happened. Um, we've seen a, a, an increase in the initial planting spacing. Um, we've seen a reduction in rotation length. Uh, we've seen a decrease in the age of which trees are thinned, and therefore the height at which they've been thinned, and also the intensity of thinning. Um, in Cyclone Bowler in the 1980s, uh, there was a lot of damage in, in Kaimbaroa Forest was associated with uh, production thinning 
uh, carried out at quite quite old ages, um, as you'd expect by definition, uh, and also quite severe. You were seeing, you know, most extreme reduction, extreme cases, reductions in stocking from say 1,200 stems per hectare down to about 250 in one hit at mean top height 18 metres. Um, that's very severe um, thinning operation, and as a result, the the trees uh, came down. These sort of operations have largely ceased, and, and, and also since this time we haven't had any really, really large windstorms. Um, so we can see that the, there's actually, there appears to be a trend of, um, of a reduction in the risk or in the proportion of the estate damaged. Um, but is this just a short term aberration? Uh, one of the problems is we, we're constrained, we're having a data set of about 60 odd years, um, and because we've had a change to the underlying structure of the forest estate, it's very difficult to make this, uh, any informed um, judgments about what might happen in the future based on what's happened in the past. So really, um, we've, we're forced into taking a mechanistic approach. Uh, and we, we're using this to address some of the key questions of interest. One of the things we want to know is what is the relative risk of different species, um, particularly from a carbon forestry perspective. Um, and some of the, the uh, what uh, Mark has mentioned in his talk, uh, for, on certain uh, parts of the landscape, we may not want to plant radiated pine under an intensively managed uh, regime. Uh, people are looking at other species such as redwoods and eucalypts, and what we want to know is what is the relative risk of wind damage. Um, silvicultural regimes have also changed over <coughs> time and will change into the future as well. Um, so people have different management objectives, and we want to know what is the relative risk of different silvicultural regimes. We also need to know how does the risk change over the life of a stand. If you're going to plant long, long rotations, um, would you do so if, if you have better information about the risk, how risk changes over time? So understanding your risk profiles is important. And also, we really want to know how does the risk vary spatially across New Zealand? Um, and, you know, and I'll put how um, in brackets, um, will, will this risk change in the future? So really, as I said earlier, uh, trying to make decisions about or trying to understand what might happen in the future based on what's happened in the past it, it is necessarily difficult. Uh, and problematic. Um, we, we, we have lack of data. Um, we're talking about relatively rare events, so um, empirical studies uh, in this area um, ha have problems. So we've taken a mechanistic approach to looking at this problem, and th this is very consistent with what people internationally have been doing. Um, this is We've borrowed heavily on, on what the Europeans are doing to understand the risk of wind throw and how this might vary in the, uh, in the future. Um, the main thing, don't, don't get too, too wound up about this diagram. Uh, all, all it's saying really is we, we've got two components to our um, understanding how the risk varies. Uh, what we're trying to do is, is understand how the trees fail um, and we want to know how the risk <coughs> varies over um, the climate, uh, varies over the terrain, sorry. And, uh, and also, sorry I said two, there's really three components. Um, and also how does the probability of getting wind speeds um, of different magnitude, uh, how does that vary over the, over the uh, landscape? So we put those two together, we come up with a critical wind speed or a, a threshold wind speed at which uh, wind damage occurs. And from our analysis of the wind climate, we know what is the probability of that wind speed being equaled or exceeded. Um, and that then, um, uh, from the model, this, this probability drops out. Um, so we can use that to look at the, the, the compare. We can use that, sorry, to compare regimes. So if we look at a number of if we look at uh, three regimes here, uh, an unthinned regime, a regime where we thinned the stand to uh, 200 trees per hectare at um, about age eight, and a regime where we thinned to 500 trees per hectare at age eight, um, you can see quite clearly the the effect of the decline in, uh, so the increase in risk or the decline in critical wind speed over time. Um, and you can see the effect of the thinning. When we did the severe thinning, there's a very abrupt drop in the critical wind speed. And then slowly over time, the stand increases in stability. And it only just gets back to the stability of the unthinned stand. Whereas the, the stand that had a lighter thinning, um, you, so, as you would expect, the drop in uh, critical wind speed or the increase in risk is not as, as, as great. Um, and then the stand improves over time um, and actually uh, eventually uh, <coughs> is better um, to is more wind stable than the unthin stand. Um, the other component of then is, is the risk and um, if we go back here, in many cases these differences in critical wind speed may only be small, we may only be talking a 
couple of metres per second. Um, but because the, the probability of a particular wind speed being equaled or exceeded um, has, has this uh, quite horrendous looking form, the main thing to note is there's two exponentials. There's an exponential to an exponential. So a small change in critical wind speed translates to a very, very large change in risk. And you can see it here. This, uh, if, you, if you can try and visualise the two diagrams side by side, here's your thinning, the increase in risk associated with thinning to 500 um, trees per hectare, and here's the, here's the change in risk thinning to 200 trees per hectare. Um, it's, a, it's a much greater difference, and, and this, you can see the spike in risk that persists for, for a number of years. So that's, that's a, a model we've used to be able to evaluate um, the effects of silver culture and a number of factors on uh, the risk of wind throw. So we can actually now start to use this to look at what might uh, what, what might uh, future change in climate mean in terms of the risk of wind throw to forests? Um, I think it's, it's probably worth stating straight up that wind is probably the least under, well understood of the um, climate elements and, and in terms of what future climate change may mean. Um, having said that, NIWA has produced a series of predictions, um, but I think they would be the first to admit um, that it's sort of putting a finger in the air. Um, so what they see is that the frequency of extreme winds is likely to increase in almost all regions in the winter, but to decrease in the summer. Um, the predicted magnitude of the increase in extreme wind speed is not large, um, and that there's likely to be increased cyclone activity over the Tasman Sea in summer. So what we've looked at um, is just, here's some sort of initial guesses as to what these predictions may mean in terms of um, the potential impact on wind damage risk. So for the same, for those regimes that I've just shown, one way we can, can look at the, uh, at the effect of um, these changes and predicted changes in wind speeds, uh, extreme wind speeds, is, is to um, modify the distribution of extreme wind speeds. So we keep the, the mean wind speed the same and we just, we fatten the tail uh, of extreme wind speed distribution. And so what I've shown here is uh, a regime grown on two contrasting sites, a, a, a more benign site and a more extreme site um, here in the blue. And then I've taken that distribution of extreme wind speeds and I've, I've basically fattened the tail out by, by manipulating one of the parameters of that distribution by 5% and by 10%. And these are the sort of typical values that the Europeans have used in their same um, in the, uh, similar analyses. And it's really just intended to show the sensitivities um, to wind risk, to, to, to uh, these changes in the wind climate. And what you can see is that, as you would expect, there, there, is, there is an increase in risk. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's not really that great. Um, I think one of the effects that's probably going to come through as being, being uh, more important is going to be the changes in, in our silvicultural regimes. Um, and also the, the, the feedback uh, that we get from increased tree growth. And so I was, I was really interested to see the results that um, Miko's come up with because that's the next stage in this is to incorporate the, the um, increased tree growth into the simulation. And certainly in, in, in the simulations I've seen in Europe, that, that has been the, the most important effect, um, has been the increase in tree height at a given age um, makes the stands more vulnerable over, over um, the baseline scenario. So in summary, um, there is considerable uncertainty about future predictions of the wind climate. Um, risk of wind damage is strongly dependent on stand structure. Um, and model predictions are not overly sensitive to predicted increases in wind speeds, um, but I think they will be uh, sensitive to uh, uh, future predictions around increased tree growth.